I think that's the one I did hit. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we got, we got two questions here. Let's deal with Alex. If you don't mind, let me tackle the lab question first. If you're okay with that. That's fine. All right. So when we derive the simple pendulum period formula. Uh, so period was 2 pi square root. So for simple harmonic motion, 2 pi square root of m over k, where k is the spring constant. And for the simple pendulum, 2 pi square root of l over g. So those are basically the two formulas. When, so simple harmonic motion assumes that the force is equal, uh, do it slightly differently, that k times the displacement, spring constant times the displacement from equilibrium, negative on one side or the other, is equal to mass times acceleration. In other words, there is a relationship between some function for position and its second derivative, in essence. Because acceleration deals with the change in velocity over change in time, and velocity deals with change in position over change in time. So there's a mathematical relationship between these two, and that's what we did a couple weeks ago. For a simple pendulum, you end up with negative g sine theta is equal to uh, l times theta. I think that was the Something like that. Uh, how you get that uh, equation? Oh, how we go? Oh, okay, we'll drop back further. So if I have some angle theta here, if I look at the forces acting on the, the mass here, I have weight acting down, and then I have tension acting this way. The object's going to accelerate in this direction. It's not going to get closer to the fulcrum or farther away from the fulcrum. So in that sense, we have to break weight up into its components. And so we had weight times the sine of theta acting this way, tension acting that way, and weight times the cosine of theta acting away from the pendulum. So W sine theta is the force that's driving it in that direction. And that's equal to mass times the acceleration of the object. Acceleration. Uh, or I know that speed is equal to the angular speed times the radius. Or dropping back one, one step further, is that if I have a circle, that the arc length here, S, is related to the angle and the radius through the formula that S, the arc length, is equal to R times theta. If we take the change with respect to time, so the change in the arc length is equal to r times the change in theta, divided by time. That's the speed. Is equal to r times the angular speed. So the change in speed is equal to r times change in angular speed, divided by time, divided by time. And we get acceleration is equal to r times alpha. So if we put that substitution in here, where r is this length right here, this becomes mg sine theta is equal to mr alpha, or ml. Mass cancels out. Uh, the minus sign shows up for the fact that this thing is going to accelerate that way, but the angle is that way. So they're in opposite directions. So a minus sign shows up somewhere. I'm just gonna put it on the left side. And so that gets us to here. Uh, yeah, that gets us to here. So everything, this is, there are no shortcuts that we've taken at any point at this point. Other than I know I've just rushed through this, this particular explanation. 
we want to get it into this form right here. Well, that's when we use the small angle approximation that negative G theta is equal to L theta. Oh, wait, that's not, sorry, that's not theta, that's alpha. Equal to L alpha. That this, if theta is small. So this, Setting sine theta equal to theta only works if we're dealing with a small angle. And so that's the just, and so we then get a period here doing a parallel between the two. And it, but it does assume we're dealing with a small angle. So I would expect that we should get pretty close to the, the, this formula for the period if we pull it back slightly and just let go. But by the time if we pull it back here, I expect to be much farther off. And so that's what the, those questions are about. Uh, it makes sense. Okay. Yeah, okay. I try to uh, show on the YouTube for the explanation, but I really, really don't understand how, why they don't use the sign theta instead of the why they use the approximation, so I understand. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Other questions on the labs that we're here? Then to Alice's question, uh, chapter 21, problem 17, I believe. Yeah. The memory's not completely broken. It's okay if I uh, sharpen this. I don't want to disrupt it. One is all. Oh, I got to erase. Kong, uh, I was going to erase this. Are you? Okay. That'll be on Blackboard, right? Yeah. Okay. It's the video last. Pardon? The video that will be on Blackboard, right? Or on YouTube. Yeah, it will okay. cool, eventually be there. So I'm going to double check it. Make sure it's recording, actually. It is. On Thursday, I was recording the my Physics 151 class, and we took a break, and so I paused it, and then forgot to turn it back on. And that was a three hour class, and basically half the class got lost. So. Yes, it will be there, assuming I don't pause it and forget to turn it back on. All right, so 30 gram string, and I'm looking at it like I'm gonna remember when I turn around, so let's bring the book with me. Mass of string is 0.3 kilograms. Go ahead and convert that. Uh, length of string 2.5 meters. Vibrates with an amplitude of 8 millimeters. 008 meters. Tension in the string is 46 newtons. What must be the frequency power of 90 watts? All right, and power formula is not one that I have committed. It's not one that sticks in my head. So I'm gonna look for the formula here. So power is two pi squared, frequency squared, amplitude squared, times the linear density, times the speed of the wave. All right, so amplitude we know. We're trying to find frequency. So that's what we're trying to find. My linear density, I'm gonna pull from this information right here. I need to know mass and length. So my linear density, mass divided by length, 0.3 kilograms over 2.5 meters. 
0.12 kilograms per meter. Thank you. And so I now know mu, and I need to know speed. Well, I have two formulas for speed of wave. Apologize for the hand gesture. Two formulas for the speed of the wave. Uh, speed. Oh, it's written right here. And so we know tension, we know linear density now because we found it, so we can find the speed. And so it becomes the square root of 46 newtons divided by 0.12 kilograms per meter. 19.6 meters per second. And as with all problems, you just wait for that voice to sort of tell you what the answers are. And that helps. Don't to come across as mocking you. I was, I was celebrating the fact that you were just feeding the answers. Okay. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so now it's a matter of solving for frequency. So since I want frequency by itself, I need to get everything else over. It's linked to frequency by multiplication, so I divide. So I get my power over 2 pi squared, amplitude squared, mu times v. So we now have 90 over 2 pi squared times 0 0.008 squared times 0 0.12 times 19.6. Yes, sir. And that'll be frequency squared. Oh, sorry, sorry. Jumped the gun there. And so take the square root at the end. Is that sufficient or is there a part that? I think that's good. Um, one of my questions, one of my other things was sometimes it's written as square root of FL over uh, mass, so force times length over mass, and sometimes it's written as F over mu. Is there any reason for that or just for the equation? So for, oh, over here? Uh, for the velocity. For the velocity. That sometimes it's written, okay. Sometimes it's written like that, and sometimes it's written as force times length over mass. Oh. Is there any reason of bouncing between the two? Or? No, it's, since mu is mass divided by length, that becomes the square root of tension over mass divided by length. And dividing by a fraction, same as multiplying by the reciprocal, so that's the same as the tension times the length over mass. Mm -hmm. uh, Just whatever. It, there's a term that a physics professor came up that mentioned to me, I don't know if he came up with it or not, called conservation of, com of complexity. The more letters I have, usually the straight up plug and chug it is, so it's you know less complex because there's more laid out for you. Or you can express it in fewer letters, but there's more in each letter. So it depends on how you want to do it. It's just consolidating, consolidating uh, yeah. variables. And potentially some people have a fear of Greek letters, and so <laughs> they would rather see it this way. The issue that I might have with this presentation is think about in the vibrating string lab that you did, where you had the mass of the string and the length of the string, which you were measured straight up, first off. And then in the lab, you had a hanging mass and you had a vibrating length, which is different from the full length. And so the issue potentially with here is which length is this, which mass is this, whereas here, Linear density is going to be of the string. And so that, however, you, again, it comes down to whatever you're more comfortable with. Uh, yeah, I think I, did I just give you both? Uh, I think so 20, it was the mu and then it flipped after yeah. that. So the equations I gave you. I gave you the three that they gave for wave speed in the summary section, and then I wrote it out like that. Because they don't have a subscript T next to the force. So I gave you what they gave plus the way I generally write it. Other questions?
questions at the moment? I'm assuming Thomas is snowing us. Uh, I can text them. Uh, yeah. I can text them and see if he's on the way. Uh, that would be nice. Uh, it's also raining, so I know there are certain places that just bog down as soon as there's water in the air. <laughs> oh, uh, he messaged me. Ten minutes ago and said, I'm just leaving my house, so he gave off ten minutes. Yeah. So I can song and tap dance for another couple minutes, or we can begin and he's just going to have to deal with it. And you can do another problem if you want. I, it comes down to if you want. So. I'm feeling better than I have about this one. Okay. Um, are you going to ask other questions? What do you say? Okay, let's just begin this thing. I mean, Thomas is going to show up any moment. Okay. I'm pausing this. Would someone please remind me? Yes. Skip some in there. So I guess we had 13, 14, 21, 22. Yeah, 15 was fluids. Yeah, so four chapters. All right. Then let's start the first topic of the next test. Uh, the equations on the board, I assume you're very familiar with. These are known as Maxwell's equations. Uh, this is the, the, the calculus form. Now, I know all of you have had uh, at least some calculus uh, integral, that familiar antiderivative. I got a that couple of nods. What's that circle? The circle means you're, well, we'll talk about that in just a second. So these are known as Maxwell's equations. And if you took 152 or 252, pretty much the bulk of the course is getting to these equations right here. So uh, basically looking at the electric field over the area, surface area of some, what's called a Gaussian surface. So if I have, so I have th some three dimensional object and I'm looking at the, how the electric field react how the electric field is oriented relative to the surface. And so the circle right there means that I'm doing this over the entire surface. Oh. So it's a closed surface. That's what the CS over here means, closed surface. And ultimately, if you did that, if you looked at the, how the electric field behaves at all points all around the surface, or the orientation of the electric field with respect to the surface, that's just going to be equal to the enclosed, whatever charge is inside this surface divided by this 
epsilon naught, which is known as the permittivity of free space. It's just a constant, and it's roughly equal to 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12th Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. And by the way, your textbook sort of hand waves over all of this, so this is additional detail. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to do the calculus, I'm just, this is setting up for conceptually the nature of light. What I have in blue over here, this is a capital phi. The subscript E indicates that we're talking about the electric one. This is known as the electric flux. The one down here is known as the magnetic flux. talk briefly about what flux is. So the electric field and magnetic field, notice they have the vector symbol over them. The vector symbol, that they are vectors. So let's just talk about the electric field. So the electric field is an indication of, no one else does uses this term, but I will. They're kind of like electric pheromones. So for example, if I have a universe here with a proton in it, positive charge, and I stick another positive charge into it, what is this proton going to do? It's going to stay away from the other proton. Okay, more than just stay away, it's, Aaron, you did the hand gesture. They yeah. So here's the fundamental question. How does, this know pro how does this proton know that that proton exists? There's no magnet if, you, if they're just start out sitting there. So this was a, an issue that was faced by physicists early on, and then suddenly they made up something. If in doubt, you make something up, and later found out that they guessed true, or at least close enough. So what they speculated was, before that second proton shows up, the first proton is giving off something, and that's the electric field. So it gives off this electric field in all directions, just radiates this out. This is why I call them electric pheromones. Again, I'm the only one. And that the other proton comes along and it senses the electric field and then reacts to that. It's not actually reacting to the proton, it's reacting to the electric field created by the proton. So you can picture an electric field as these arrows coming from a charge. So, imagine I got an electric field that's shooting across the room, straight across the room that way. Just however many arrows you want to picture, just going straight across from that side to that side. And then I stick a piece of paper in there. So just imagine this piece of paper is being penetrated by a whole bunch of arrows. Now, how many arrows is it getting penetrated by? Less. Less. Fewer. Okay. Yeah, far less. Yeah. So I appreciate the grammatical correction. Uh, and if it's perfectly flat, I mean, this obviously says curls, there's no Robin Hood split in the arrow kind of thing. That if the surface is infinitesimally thin, if it's like this, those arrows are just going to pass. We're going to pass by there, not going to penetrate this piece of paper at all. This is the essence of what electric flux is. It is a way of measuring how much of these electric field lines are actually penetrating the surface. The dot here indicates that it cares about the perpendicular, uh, cares about parallel. How, many, how much of the electric field is parallel to the area vector? Which then comes into, I got a piece of paper here. Let's just say it's laying flat like that. What is the direction of the area vector? 
it's parallel. To what? To the uh, electric field. Uh, this is completely different from, this is separate from the electric field. This is just, a, I have an area, piece of paper with an area. What is the direction of the area of the vector? Because I have this A right here with a vector symbol over it. Um, How do you define the direction of the area of this piece of paper? E delta. Oh. It's vertical. The area vectors are perpendicular to the surface. So it's either going this way or it's going that way. Oh. This is the powers that be made this up. This is not for us to question them. So, so if you have an area vector this way and the electric field that way, now we'll bring the electric field back, they are perpendicular to each other. So mathematically, the flux is zero if they're perpendicular. Because dot product like parallel. The second one deals with the magnetic field. I did eventually find out why they use B for magnetic field, and that's because the person who was writing the paper that defined it used A for the first symbol, B for the next one, C for the next one, D for the next one, and B stuck for whatever reason. And this, so this says that the magnetic flux through any closed surface is zero. And the difference here is that magnetic fields don't have a beginning and end. The magnetic field, if you have a magnet with a north and south pole, the magnetic field comes out the north side, goes into the south side, goes through the south side to the north side inside the magnet, and basically it's one continuous loop. Whereas electric fields begin and end at charging. All right. These are both known as Gauss's Law. This is Gauss's Law of Electricity, Gauss's Law of Magnetism. You can, the math behind it, Gauss. All right, then we get over here. This is known as Faraday, usually called Faraday's Law. I think Lentz deserves credit, so Faraday, Lentz's Law. Faraday is the one who came up with the concept, published first. Lentz is the one who came up with the math. Some textbooks credit Lentz with the negative sign there, but Lentz, I feel, deserves more credit than that. This first part of this one down here, this is known as Ampere's Law. I think the accent mark is that way on the E. The axon cloud, I think it is. This term on the end here is known as Maxwell's correction. And again, 152, 252, we would actually derive these or at least come up with more justification than by just throwing them off on the board. chance to uh, catch up somewhat mentally and then we'll talk about what this has to do with light and I will tie my shoe. Unfortunately, I'm videotaping my tying my shoes just so future generations will understand that I did this kind of thing. Uh, what was Maxwell's uh, correction? That last term. This Maxwell contributed that. There was a, a, a flaw and he filled the flaw. There was a gap and he filled the gap. That's probably better analogy. Now all four equations are called Maxwell's equations. Maxwell did not do that. This was done afterwards. Maxwell put in the last piece. So who is Maxwell? British physicist. Oh. Uh, he came out with the correction 1870 or so. Oh. We were still recovering from the war. 1870? Yeah. Uh, war? Civil War? Civil, Civil War. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, we, we weren't really in a position for deeper thoughts at that time. True. All right, so let's connect this up with the light. Maxwell takes this stuff and he goes, all right, suppose I have a charge right here. Let's just make it a positive charge. So I got a positive charge here. It's giving off this electric field. So I don't have to label every single arrow. So I have an electric field and you draw it until you get tired. And then I move that charge over to here. As I move that charge, well, think about that. If I'm looking at some point in space right here, X mark in that spot, at this point, my electric field is now going in all sorts of directions also. Red shift? Pardon? Uh, oh, wait, no, blue shift, because that's... Uh... Oh. You, yeah, you could actually... That's what it is. Do more of that. Um, there is, there would be a, some Doppler effect there, but that's not the part that we care about. Right. So from at when the proton was here, or the positive charge was here, it exerted in the, an electric field in that direction. When it's here, it's exerting an electric field in that direction. So therefore, I have a change in my electric field. Everyone good with us? Yeah. All right. Alex, you've got that. Wait a second. Okay. Trying to, trying to guess your look. Not hard to judge looks based on purely eyes. But. Okay. So if I have a change in the electric field, that means I have a change in my electric flux. I can always just put a surface around this thing. or put a surface around that thing. If I have a change in my electric flux, that means I've created a magnetic field. And that's basically how the way you create a magnetic field is you just have a charge that moves. That creates a magnetic field. If you have a neutral atom that's moving all together, then it tends all the magnetic fields that are created tend to cancel each other out because it's neutral. Helium, like such as the noble gases, right? So, or not really? Uh, noble gases by themselves. I mean, the hydrogen gas, hydrogen's not noble, but uh, H2 is neutral and oh. stable. 